Greetings again, listeners. We're going to talk here about the spleen and what makes it big. So we're just going to go over the anatomy and function of the spleen probably more than you want to, but uh, it's good to know uh, because although the spleen, it, a lot of times it gets to the shaft when you're talking about different organs in the abdominal cavity, we like to spend more time talking about the kidneys and the stomach and the liver, and probably for good reason. And there's a lot more things that can go wrong there. Uh, and you need those organs to live. The spleen, on the other hand, you don't need to live. Uh, it serves a useful purpose, but not a uh, not a critical purpose for for life. You can have your spleen removed and you survive uh, and live. Uh, that having been said, the spleen serves a good purpose for doctors. Uh, the reason is because there are a lot of things that can cause splenomegaly, and splenomegaly can be a symptom of those things, and it can be the symptom that points you uh, in that direction. So, for instance, uh, various hematologic disorders like spherocytosis and elliptocytosis, some of those red blood cell membrane disorders, uh, that can cause splenomegaly. Uh, certainly various infections can cause uh, splenomegaly, so viral infections in particular, we're going to talk about one of them. Uh, and then things that happen in babies, so congenital syphilis, uh, congenital toxoplasmosis, and then uh, malignancies uh, like acute or chronic leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, uh, and then congestive problems. Remember that the we're going to see that the circulation of the spleen is very intimately associated with the circulation of the liver. So if you have cirrhosis or thrombosis uh, somewhere in that area, the spleen can get big because of congestion. All right, let's look at anatomy here. So we have our spleen here, which is roughly at the level of the 9th to 11th rib. And it is nestled up behind the stomach. The stomach's been removed here. Uh, and it sits pressed up against the side of the body, the left side, uh, up kind of on the rib cage. Uh, separating it from the rib cage is the diaphragm here, which we see. And then it's also uh, in front of the left kidney. Now the spleen is uh, has got its own circulation. It's got an artery and a vein named after it. The artery comes off the celiac trunk. Remember that the celiac trunk is the very, very first major vessel coming off of the aorta after it crosses the diaphragm. And the celiac trunk gives rise to three arteries, even though you can't see all of them here. It gives rise to the splenic artery, and then it also gives rise to the common hepatic artery, which is probably this one here, and then also the left gastric artery. And the splenic artery also has its own uh, branches that it gives off, mostly the, to the pancreas and to the stomach, which makes sense because they're right in that area. So all that blood is going to go to the spleen. 90% of it is going to go through filtration system. The other 10% will kind of bypass it uh, and escape most of the, the splenic activity. Uh, and then that blood's going to come back out through the vein, and the vein the splenic vein will meet up with a few different veins, notably the inferior mesenteric vein, and then there's a few other veins, short gastric veins, uh, left gastroepiploic, uh, and then ultimately the inferior mesenteric vein. And once it hits the inferior mesenteric vein, it then becomes the portal vein. And you know what the portal vein does? It goes up into the liver where it then is uh, gets filtered, does all the things that the liver does, and then finally will come out uh, deoxygenated blood through the hepatic vein, which will then meet up with the inferior vena cava and then out to the right side of the heart. So also another good thing to know is that you have the left kidney sitting right behind the spleen, and that's going to be useful when you're looking with an ultrasound. Uh, usually, in a lot of cases, when you're looking uh, with the ultrasound, uh, when you're looking at the spleen, you're mostly going to be doing that in a trauma setting, which again is another important function of the spleen, is that it can cause you to bleed out. Uh, so if you have a patient that's been in a car accident, for instance, you're certainly going to be doing your FAST exam, and one of the things you're going to be looking for is, uh, is uh, a shattered spleen, splenic avulsion, uh, lacerations of the spleen, because you have so, such rich vasculature there uh, that if you have a problem uh, like a laceration of the spleen you can bleed really significantly and it's going to go right up in between either the uh, the between the spleen and the chest wall or between the spleen and the kidney. 
All right, so this is uh, your microanatomy of the spleen. Do not worry at all about knowing the histology for step two and three. You will not be asked that. Uh, however, it's good to know what's going on here. So you have two different, uh, well, okay, so you have a cortex, right, and you have a medulla. Uh, but the important functional parts of the spleen are what's known as red pulp and white pulp. So the red pulp, and they get their name from the way the spleen looks when it's not stained. Once it's stained, it doesn't look red and white anymore. But the red pulp is pretty much all of this sort of parenchyma looking stuff, and it's composed of reticular cells. There's some macrophages in there. You'll probably see some red blood cells. Uh, and then these collapsed endothelial passages, which you can't really see here because this is uh, such a low magnification. Uh, but those are known as the cords of Bill Roth, uh, which he was probably a surgeon because there's some surgical procedures named after him, too. Then you have your white pulp, and again, it does not look white, but the white pulp is composed of lymphoid cells. So in between the red pulp and these sort of germinal centers, you have uh, what's known as a marginal zone, and the marginal zone is composed of dendritic cells, antigen-presenting cells, and that makes sense that they're kind of on the margin there because you have your circulation, and within your circulation, you have antigens, and those antigens then are going to get to those antigen-presenting cells, which then can express that antigen and present it to T cells. And those T cells exist right here. It's this very purplish portion. And those T cells then become activated uh, once they come into contact with an appropriate antigen-presenting cell, and then they can subsequently activate these B cells here, which then are going to uh, produce antibody. And those B cells exist in these germinal centers. So here, again, you see much greater magnification. Uh, you can see uh, that you've got these T cells here, and then uh, you can actually see some of the cellular anatomy of these B cells, which are busy making antibodies. So you can see, based just on this, that... If you lose your spleen, you lose a lot of uh, your ability, well, not a lot, but you lose a good amount of your ability uh, to, make, uh, to make antibodies because a lot of it goes on here. And so that's important because if you lose your spleen for one reason or another and you're not making as much antibodies, remember what you need your antibodies for. You need them for getting rid of particularly pyogenic bacteria and it's going to be those pyogenic bacteria that uh, you're going to be susceptible to if you don't have a spleen. Uh, you can also, on this, appreciate these arterioles here. Okay. And then, oh yeah, red blood cells. These red blood cells are dying. Uh, they're being destroyed. So the spleen serves three major functions. Uh, first of all, you, it is responsible for storage, and it stores a few different things, but it you can store within your spleen all sorts of different blood components. We saw that there are white blood cells there, and there's also red blood cells that it can store, usually in the process of killing them. And then it can also store platelets. As a matter of fact, one-third of your circulating platelet mass is held in the spleen. You have sort of a reservoir there. And so that can be released in times of stress or with epinephrine injection. It's probably related here when you're in stress. You release epinephrine, and then you can re release platelets from that. It also serves a filtering role. So uh, a, a loss of that filtering capacity is characterized by those typical cells that you see on peripheral smear in a patient that doesn't have a functioning spleen, so like those Howell Jolly bodies and uh, Heinz bodies. And, We'll look at what we'll see what those look like. Sometimes uh, you might be shown a picture of that just because that's so basic. It also removes damaged and abnormal cells. So remember, uh, like spherocytosis and elliptocytosis, those are abnormal cells. The spleen is going to pull those out. And because if you have those genetic disorders, uh, the spleen is going to be working overtime, it's going to become enlarged. And then it also removes intracytoplasmic inclusions, and if it can't do that, you're going to get some of those uh, abnormal bodies that you see uh, on pathology slides. And then, of course, as we already talked about, it serves immunologic purposes. It's the largest lymphoid organ, and it uh, holds about half of the body's B cells that make antibodies. 
Uh, it processes the foreign material, gets it over to the antigen presenting cells, stimulate, ultimately stimulate the production of opsonizing antibodies. It's required for very early antibody production, and it also can uh, help you fight off parasites by trapping and phagocytizing intercellular parasites. It also has a role in synthesizing properdin. And if you watch my complement lectures, properdin is useful for stabilizing the C3 convertase uh, of the alternative pathway. And so if you don't have properdin, you're going to have a hard time opsonizing things. And opsonization is important for getting rid of, you guessed it, pyogenic organisms. So another reason why, if you don't have a spleen, you're going to be somewhat immunocompromised. So here's how old jolly bodies. These are just these little dots in red blood cells, and all they are is the remnant of the red blood cell nucleus. Remember, the red blood cell in its mature form is non-nucleated. Uh, however, it didn't get that way on its own. The spleen actually pulled the nucleus out. And so if you don't have a spleen, you're going to have these hollow jelly bodies. And this is visible on just your standard H&E stain. So here, again, you see a bunch of them. So here, 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 here. Not all of them are missing, uh, or not all of them have a hollow jelly body, but a lot of them do. Okay, these are Heinz bodies. These are a little different. They look just like hollow jolly bodies, except you'll see more than one. Now, with a hollow jolly body, you're only going to see one per cell because it's just the nucleus, the remnant of the nucleus. With a Heinz body, what a Heinz body is, is it's, uh, it's excess hemoglobin or hemoglobin that is denatured, uh, and typically this gets pulled out by, by the spleen. Uh, so if you don't have a, uh, a spleen, you're going to get these Heinz bodies. The thing is, with Heinz bodies, they're only noted with a special stain, and that's called the new methylene blue stain. So again, here you see they look just like hollow jelly bodies, but you're going to have more than just one. If you just see one per cell, then they're probably... Uh, you should be told what kind of stain it is if you ever get something like this on a test, uh, which you won't because the USMLE Step 2 and 3 is not going to ask you detailed pathology questions, but just to know uh, that if you see these, uh, usually you can differentiate Heinz bodies out just based on the fact that there's more than one uh, in, in a cell. All right, let's do a vignette here. So this is a 15-year-old boy presenting to your clinic with his mother complaining of a sore throat, body aches, and fatigue for the last 10 days. He was seen six days ago in the clinic for sore throat. Both a rapid strep and a flu test came back negative. He was discharged with the presumptive diagnosis of common cold. Since then, his symptoms have not improved. His mom says that he's missed two days of school, and she's beginning to wonder whether or not he's, quote, just pretending so he can get out of school. You see that pretty often. Uh, he's vitally stable, blood pressure 115 over 75, heart rate 75, Respirations 12, temperature 100 degrees even Fahrenheit. There is mild cervical lymphadenopathy and apparent swelling and injection of the tonsils. Lungs are clear to auscultation. There's some mild tenderness in the left upper quadrant, and the spleen is palpable two centimeters below the costal margin. There's no hepatomegaly. Abdominal sounds are normal, grossly neurologically intact. No other abnormalities are appreciated at this time. Labs are ordered and are as follows. So you can pause it and read this again. If you want, we'll go on and look at the labs here. So we get a CMP, CDC, and a SED rate. Pretty good uh, set of labs to get if you're suspecting an infection of any kind. So we note that our CMP is notable only for mildly elevated liver enzymes. These aren't really too high. Uh, now, this is a 15-year-old boy. Maybe he's drinking. Have a nice little binge night the night before. You could have slightly elevated liver enzymes. Uh, but this is probably non-consequential for the most part because he's, uh, he's not that high. Uh, just mildly elevated. Typically when there's something really wrong with the liver, it's going to be much higher than the upper limit of normal. A CBC shows uh, some pretty useful things. So uh, here we have a white count that's uh, high. And we also note that it's predominantly lymphocytes. And that is going to help you understand that this is a viral infection, not a bacterial infection, because if it were a bacterial infection, 
you'd have elevated neutrophils. And then finally, the platelet count is mildly depressed, although this is not something you'd ever need to treat. Typically, we don't start thinking of treatment until you're going below like 50 or 60,000. And then the sed rate is up. Now, you should always, anytime you get a first CBC, you should always get a smear with it. Because if you're ever thinking something like anemia, you want to know, are these hypochromic or non-hypochromic red blood cells? Uh, now, in, in our case here, uh, which you probably know what we're thinking of, uh, just based on his presentation, or at least you should, uh, you want to know uh, if we have atypical lymphocytes, because this is a very uh, important finding uh, if you're suspecting this particular disorder. Uh, you probably know what we're talking about. I'm just being funny by making it secret. but uh, So we see 20% atypical lymphocytes. I'm not going to show you a picture of what atypical lymphocytes look like because I don't want to bog you down with unimportant stuff for, uh, for the test. Uh, and then the sed rate is up, and that's nonspecific, but it says that there's inflammation going on. So now that we know these things, let's talk about how we can uh, figure out what this patient has. So he has sore throat, body aches, and fatigue. And sore throat and body aches and fatigue can be a lot of things. It can be just regular old common cold, certainly. Uh, that's definitely going to cause body aches and fatigue. Sore throat, not so much, but you can get some irritation, I suppose. Uh, it can also be strep throat, certainly strep throat. And with, uh, with this presentation, it looks a lot like strep throat because he's got a sore throat, he's got body aches and fatigue, and if you ignore the fact that he's got a big spleen, uh, he's got the cervical lymphadenopathy, he's got swelling of the tonsils, uh, and then he's also got an absence of, of, of cough. And all of that really points towards strep throat. Now, how do we know he doesn't have strep throat? Well, a few days ago he was in and he had a rapid strep test and it came back negative. So if you think about it, in between, in between six days ago and now, he probably didn't get strep throat in between now and then. And the fact also that he had these symptoms before he got that rapid strep test and it came back negative. Uh, so we can rule out strep right, right just from that. Uh, but what else is important here? So he has cervical lymphadenopathy. That makes sense. He's got some kind of infection going on. Uh, but he's also got the swelling and injection of the tonsils. So if it's not strep throat, what is it? Well, we do the rest of our exam. We know uh, mild tenderness in the left upper quadrant and the spleen is enlarged. And that is very useful at pointing us towards what this is. And if you haven't figured it out yet, it is mononucleosis. Uh, but this is... You're not always going to see uh, splenomegaly in, in mono. And the reason is because the spleen has to get quite big before you can actually feel it. It's got to go up about to two to three times normal uh, to actually appreciate a, a, a splenomegaly. However, most patients with mono, they do have a splenomegaly. If you were to look at it with a CT, you would probably be able to appreciate that there is a splenomegaly. Uh, but in order to feel it on physical exam, it's got to be significantly enlarged. Uh, but we do, we do feel it in this patient. It's palpable two centimeters below the costal margin, so he does have splenomegaly. So you put this all together. You've got this classic triad of sore throat, body aches, and, uh, and splenomegaly. Uh, we are pretty sure uh, then, just based on that, that he's got, uh, that he's got mono. Uh, there are a lot of different infections that can cause splenomegaly, uh, mono being one of them, but just this clinical picture looks just like mono. And he's also that typical population uh, that comes with mono, older adolescents, young adults. And then this kind of protracted course. So he's had this for 10 days. If it were cold, it probably wouldn't last that long. If it was the flu, it wouldn't last that long. Uh, but with mono, these symptoms can go on and on for two, three, four weeks. Uh, so this protracted course points to that too. The cervical lymphadenopathy, it's always going to be present in mono. You're always going to have lymphadenopathy with mono because it really does affect the entire lymphatic system. And you probably see lymphadenopathy elsewhere, but the neck is a good place to start.
And then finally, when we order our labs, and you don't really need to go out of your way lab-wise, you're just going to get basic labs, you get a CBC, CMP, and a smear, uh, you find that you have elevated white cells with lymphocytes, and that is always going to be present. You're always going to have you're always going to have lymphocytosis uh, with mono, and then you also note that 20% are atypical. And a, Diagnostically, if you have more than 20% atypical lymphocytes, that's almost certainly mono. Uh, if it's between 10 and 20, it really points you in the direction, but you can't diagnose it just based on that. Um, another test that you could do here would be uh, to get specific antibodies for mono, and certainly uh, that can be part of your diagnosis. Uh, but if you come back with 20% atypical lymphocytes and a clinical picture of mono, that's enough for diagnosis. So infectious mononucleosis is a communicable infection, very communicable infection, caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, when I was 15 years old, just like this patient, I got mono. And uh, actually, um, it was not through intimate contact with body secretions. That sounds so sexual, doesn't it? And I guarantee you, my mom, the very first thing she asked me was, oh, I suppose you got this from kissing somebody, because everybody knows mono is known as the kissing disease. And certainly you can get it from kissing, but what else do teenagers and young adults do? They share drinks, uh, they are in close proximity to each other. Certainly you can get, if somebody sneezes on you, that can, is certainly enough to get, to get mono. Uh, so it does not have to be through intimate contact. I don't like that word. But this is the this is what I found on Medscape. This is how whatever doctor wrote this described it was intimate contact with body secretions, primarily oral pharyngeal secretions. But there are a couple things that make this whole idea that this is the kissing disorder such a terrible uh, analogy. And the reason, uh, besides the fact that you can that you can get this from other means like sharing a drink also because if you're gonna go up to a kid and ask them well have you been kissing somebody who's been sick there are problems with that first of all you're you're going to be shedding Epstein-Barr virus for a long time after you're no longer symptomatic so the person might not even be sick at that time secondly it takes a while, once you get the Epstein-Barr virus, if you're going to get mono, it takes about a month or two for it to incubate and then cause symptoms. So it's very difficult to correlate those together, even if it was caused by kissing. Uh, so if you know mononucleosis as the kissing disease, forget it as that, because there are so many ways you can get mono. So what's going on here is that uh, you have these B cells that are infected with this virus. And these B cells exist all sorts of different places, but they exist on your oropharyngeal epithelium, and that's going to be a big reason why you get pharyngitis from it. You also have these circulating B cells that go through your entire reticular endothelial system, and so they're going through the liver and the spleen and the peripheral lymph nodes, and all of that is going to be affected. Now we saw in this patient that he had mild elevation liver enzymes and that's the reason why. It's because if those B cells, those affected B cells are going to make their way to the liver and they can cause just a mild uptick in your uh, liver enzymes but certainly not enough to cause any problems. Uh, this is like I said especially common in teenagers and young adults. Now 50 percent of people will seroconvert to positive Epstein-Barr virus by age 5 and we do not see this in children that young. Uh, so for whatever reason, this just has a tendency to manifest in people who are teenagers or older. Certainly children theoretically could be affected by this, but it just classically tends to present as teenagers and young adults. Uh, so like I said, 50% convert by five years of age. The rest will typically seroconvert uh, by adolescence or young adulthood. And of those, half of them are going to develop infectious mononucleosis. But the other half will seroconvert and never develop it. Uh, so, symptom-wise, uh, fatigue, lymphadenopathy, pharyngitis, and then variably, if you can appreciate it, uh, the, uh, the splenomegaly. Uh, so this really forms your core tad for, for mononucleosis, but really these three things are going, uh, fatigue, lymphadenopathy, and pharyngitis are always going to be present 
uh, with mono. Uh, if you have these thing, three things present, it's very sensitive but not very specific for mono. Other things you can have low grade fever, nausea, and anorexia without vomiting, uh, pallido, petechiae, uh, and, and then of course splenomegaly. Now this pharyngitis, if you were to look at it, uh, it can either be just this sort of red, injected, inflamed uh, tonsils, or you can actually have exudate from that. And a lot of people think, well, if there's exudate, it must be a bacterial infection, and that's not true. Uh, you can have exudate with mono. Now, that being said, about, I think it's like 30% of patients who have mono are actually co-infected with uh, group A beta hemolytic strep. So they actually do have strep throat too. Uh, but I do believe that that, that white secretion uh, can be just from the virus too. Classically, there is going to be a lack of pulmonary symptoms. So if you hear, if you listen to the patient's chest and you hear rails, uh, you should be thinking something else. Jaundice will develop in 10 to 30% of patients. I am not exactly sure why that is, uh, but I am led to think that it may have something to do with maybe a slight hemolytic uh, process going on. Uh, I don't think it's due to anything uh, going on with the liver parenchyma. Uh, but jaundice can develop in about 10 to 30 percent of patients. Usually it's going to be older patients. So yes, older people, elderly people can get mono. Uh, they're more likely to develop that jaundice than younger people. And then tonsillitis. This is important. Tonsillitis can cause airway obstruction. The tonsillitis in mono can be so bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're very cautious uh, in patients who have tonsillitis with mono. We're very concerned about their airway. Uh, and so a lot of these patients, we're going to be giving them steroids. If they have significant enough tonsillitis when we see them, we're just going to give them steroids because that does uh, improve that inflammation and makes it less likely that they're going to have airway obstruction and then come into the ED with strider and all sorts of problems then. So for diagnosis, uh, like I said, you just uh, all you have to do is run your basic labs. So CMP, CBC, and SED rate. Uh, if you get that, you, for the most part, should have an idea of whether or not you have mono. Uh, you may need to do more tests after that. So if you have 25% atypical lymphocytes, you've got your diagnosis right there sealed up. Uh, however, if it is equivocal or you think that it may not be mono, uh, then you can get a heterophile antibody. Uh, that takes a little while, a couple days to come back. Or you can get this thing called viral capsid antigen IgM, and you can get IgG with that too. Uh, but the IgM will help you uh, know if this is a, an acute infection. Now, a VCA IgM, if you just get on a random person, it's not necessarily going to tell you if the person has mono. If it comes back positive, it could be that they had mono a long time ago. Uh, however, in the setting of an obvious clinical setting of person sick and looks like they have mono and they've got positive IgM, uh, then that's a diagnosis. Because if this came back negative, then it, it would probably not be mono because you should be developing antibodies. Uh, a rapid strep test. Why do you want to do a rapid strep test even if you don't think it's strep? Like I said, about 30% of mono patients are co-infected with, co with strep. So it's good to get a strep test uh, just to make sure. Our management for mono is going to be pretty much just supportive. So we, we give NSAIDs or acetaminophen for the fever and myalgias. It can also help a little bit with pain, um, throat pain. Uh, then we also can go at the throat pain with you know, over-the-counter throat lozenges. Uh, you can give uh, xylocaine, which is just like a gargle uh, with lidocaine, and that will help with the sore throat. Normal activity is okay. So Remember that the one concern we have, patients have, has a big spleen, we're worried about splenic rupture. And that's certainly something to bear in mind. However, splenic rupture does not happen with just your typical day-to-day -day activities. I'll tell you a story. When I had mono, my mom basically was like walking me to my bed, like making sure I didn't, you know, twist my back the wrong way. She was that worried that my spleen was going to rupture. Not necessary. Normal activity is totally fine. As a matter of fact, uh, there have been studies that have shown that prolonged bed rest actually delay uh, your recovery. So normal activity is fine. That having been said, 
if a patient uh, has, certainly if they have splenomegaly, but really any patient with mono uh, should avoid high impact sports until they are either asymptomatic, well, no, actually until both. They're asymptomatic and it's been at least three weeks from the onset of symptoms. So for instance, this patient, let's say he's a football player, 10 days ago he developed these symptoms. So we want to wait until 11 days from now, uh, and then also he's got to be asymptomatic. So if it's 11 days from now, he hits three weeks, and he still has symptoms, he's still fatigued, or you can still feel his, his spleen, which you shouldn't by then, but uh, if at that point uh, he's still having symptoms, even though it's three weeks, he still should not be in high-impact sports. So he's got, you've got to be asymptomatic, and it's got to be three weeks or more from the onset of symptoms. Some physicians and some papers that I've read recommend more. Some have said four weeks, some have said six weeks, some even said six months. Uh, but three weeks is definitely the minimum. Uh, and the studies that I've read, uh, most of them have been three to four weeks. All right. Uh, so you will also want to provide these patients with corticosteroids. Uh, the general recommendation is don't give corticosteroids to every single patient that has mono, and I can agree with that. I don't like the idea of just throwing out steroids to everybody who wants them because steroids have adverse effects too. However, if a patient has significant inflammation, tonsil inflammation, pharyngeal inflammation, it's better to be safe than sorry. Corticosteroids will help with that inflammation. It also will help to a certain degree with pain. I'll tell you another story of me having mono. It was so bad that was actually I got steroids and then it was actually my very first experience with uh, with narcotics because I wound up having to get codeine for it uh, and believe me it worked uh, but uh, this can be really bad uh, this this inflammation can get to the point where it causes strider and can cause airway problems and not to mention it's very painful too so I would err on the side of giving steroids if you feel there's significant uh, inflammation. If you're worried about, uh, if you have any concern about possible airway issues, definitely uh, give steroids. Uh, you can just you can get by with 40 milligrams a day for five days. That's really all you need. And that will, that will shrink down the inflammation enough to where they'll get through their mono without uh, their, their tonsils getting too, uh, too big again. Uh, so, as far as other things, um, management-wise, you might think, well, this is a viral infection, so should I give an antiviral? And for some time, there have been some physicians that have given out acyclovir. Uh, a meta-analysis has come out showing that there's no significant benefit from acyclovir, so no antivirals for mononucleosis. It does help with, uh, with, with making you less contagious, but because... Epstein-Barr virus is everywhere. We don't really worry about trying to protect people from it because you're going to, people are going to get it at some point, no matter what. So, you know, you send these kids to school, they're going to be around other people. Yes, they're going to possibly infect other people, but the 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 philosophy behind it is that these people are going to get infected no matter what. So, uh, there's really no point in trying to delay it because it's just such a ubiquitous virus. So there are some complications. These are so rare, uh, with the exception of, uh, of course, the upper airway obstruction, which is kind of rare, but it's such a problem. Uh, thrombocytopenia, if the uh, spleen gets large enough, it can sequester some platelets. Typically, though, that's not something that we need to really worry about or manage. Uh, there are some relations between the Epstein-Barr virus and chronic fatigue syndrome. I really just included that, though, as a piece of trivia. Functional asplenia, and then a morbilliform rash. Now, where does that morbilliform rash come from? If a patient has mono, and they were misdiagnosed as having strep, and they were treated with a penicillin drug like amoxicillin uh, or ampicillin, they can get this morbilliform rash, and it really just looks like measles. And it goes away. It's not, uh, it's, it's not really a problem, uh, but uh, that can show up. And you can get rash with mono. Uh, typically, the rash is going to be really faint and evanescent. It goes away. Uh, it's usually maculopapular, uh, but a rash can be part of mono. It's going to be very early on in, in, in the course of the mono if, if it indeed shows up. 
And so then patients like this guy that came in, uh, he should get a sonography after three weeks uh, to make sure that his spleen has uh, reverted back to normal size. And, and certainly if he wants to get back into high impact sports for one reason or another. So splenomegaly. Uh, a soft, thin spleen is palpable in 15% of neonates, 10% of children, 5% of adolescents. Uh, so you might be thinking about that and if you are aware of embryology and early development and the spleen and what, how big it is and how long it gets bigger, you sh would probably know that yes, the spleen does enlarge until puberty. It's 11 grams at birth and it's 135 grams uh, by adolescence. And so it does get bigger and bigger and bigger until adolescence and then it starts to kind of uh, shrink down a little bit. Uh, so why don't we feel it in, as much in adolescence as we do in neonates if it's getting bigger? And the reason is because everything else is getting bigger a lot faster in adolescence. So you feel it in neonates, 15% uh, of normal neonates, 5% of normal adolescents. Like I said, it's got to be about two to three times the normal size before it's going to be palpable in most people. So how do we know if a spleen is enlarged just on physical exam? Well, we kind of talked about that in our vignette. A splenic edge that's felt more than two centimeters inferior to the costal margin is abnormal. So uh, it can definitely be a lot bigger than that. But uh, the way that you're going to palpate for splenomegaly is to just start out at your costal margin and try to palpate. Uh, I would, what I would do uh, as far as technique is I would just place my hand on the costal margin and then extend your fingers, uh, your fingertips about two centimeters below and then uh, kind of curve your fingers, arc your fingers in and upward. Uh, so you can, that's a good way to kind of palpate uh, for, for the spleen. I wish I could show you a video, uh, but that's, that's where you're looking, two centimeters below the costal margin. If you can feel the spleen below that, then uh, you've got splenomegaly. Uh, there are various radiologic modalities that you can use to visualize the spleen. Uh, sonography is by far the most common, but you can also do CT. It's obviously going to be much more sensitive. And then a technetium-99 sulfur colloid scan, not used very often, uh, but that can also help you visualize the activity of the spleen, its functional capacity. What are the things that cause splenomegaly? There are so many of them. Uh, this doesn't even include all of them. So the ones in red are the ones that I could visualize the USMLE giving you a question related to splenomegaly in this kind of setting. Uh, so certainly a trauma setting. You want to look for avulsions and, and fractures of the spleen. Uh, that can cause, you can bleed out from that. Uh, so traumatic hematoma or rupture, uh, sickle cell disease, that can ultimately cause a functional asplenia. As a matter of fact, most of those patients will become functionally asplenic by some point in their life. Uh, then all of these different hematologic disorders uh, can cause it too. Uh, infections. So we already talked about one of them, infectious mononucleosis. This would be the one that I would tell you you should definitely know for the test, uh, that mono is associated with splenomegaly. Hopefully by now you've kind of gotten that. Also congenital syphilis and toxoplasmosis. You're working with neonates. Uh, Splenomegaly can be uh, seen in these children with, uh, with these infections. Uh, immunologic reactions, uh, I would bring up uh, a hypersensitivity reaction, especially to dilantin, uh, phenytoin. Uh, you can get a splenomegaly from that. That's just an immune reaction. Malignancy, so you, this is just like infiltration, uh, but with acute or chronic leukemia, especially CML, you can get uh, splenomegaly and then the lymphomas. And then congestive conditions. So uh, this is a big one. This is another one where I can see the test very easily giving you a splenomegaly patient. Uh, for instance, in the setting of a patient with congestive heart failure, your heart's not pumping enough, it, go, it gets backed up all the way down. So if you have congestive heart failure, it's very easy uh, from that to get hepatomegaly and splenomegaly because all that blood is getting backed up in your liver and so you're getting uh, you're getting fluid into your liver causing hepatomegaly uh, and then you get increased pressure in your spleen which is going to push blood and fluid out into your spleen uh, so congestive heart failure can cause that. Portal hypertension, same reason just uh, rather than the problem being at your heart it's at your liver and so 
you're going to get increased uh, vascular pressure in your spleen. Splenic vein thrombosis, again, same reason. And then Bud Chiari syndrome, all that is is thrombosis of the hepatic circulation. All right, and then also storage disorders. USMLE doesn't test that a lot. Step one likes to test those because it's very pathologically based, uh, but it's just not something you run into commonly. But what we're talking about here are things like Gauchers, Neiman Pick, uh, Hurlers, and so forth. Another good way to look at causes of splenomegaly are by mechanism. So uh, things that cause the spleen to have to function more, so things like infection, lymphopro lymphoproliferation, uh, increased red blood cell destruction, uh, that would be like spherocytosis, elliptocytosis, and then extramedullary hematopoiesis. What, what is extramedullary hematopoiesis? So that would be like if you have one of those myeloproliferative disorders, uh, if you have osteopetrosis, where your bone is invading your, uh, your bone marrow, so you don't have as much space uh, to create uh, blood cells. And then if you're on these drugs, uh, so remember you have granulocyte, uh, or uh, the GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, that's what that stands for, I think, uh, and then the GMCSF. And that's granulocyte macrophage colonating, or colony stimulating factor. Uh, but those drugs are typically given as an adjunct to chemotherapy in patients who have, uh, who have cancer uh, because chemotherapeutics can cause, as a major side effect, myelosuppression. So those drugs uh, can be given to help with uh, chemotherapy-related neutropenia. Uh, so with that, you can see splenomegaly as well. Uh, and the simple reason is because it's just causing the spleen to make uh, blood cells in addition to the bone marrow. Uh, impaired flow and congestion, we talked about that, cirrhosis, thrombosis, obstruction. And then infiltration, and that can be through those storage disorders uh, that we see in young children or through malignancy. All right, so we have this rule, uh, and this can be really useful on uh, wards. And the only problem is it's not in the metric system, and typically we measure things in the metric system. But it's a good rule uh, because it's it's very easy to remember. Uh, so a normal spleen, this is called one three five seven nine eleven rule. Those are just odd numbers from one to eleven. Uh, so a normal spleen is one inch thick. It's three inches wide in the AP direction, so going from back to front, it's three inches. It's five inches long vertically, so from the top to the bottom. Uh, but the caveat there is that the spleen varies in size. And it's proportional to the height of a patient. So a very tall patient is going to have a much longer spleen than a very short patient. It's seven ounces in mass, and then it sits between the ninth and eleventh rib. Okay, so here is sonography of the spleen. So a few things about getting a sonogram on a patient uh, looking at the spleen. Getting sonography can be very difficult if you're not familiar with it or don't know the proper technique. So the best way to get a sonogram on a spleen, patient's spleen can be difficult just based on the way it looks. Uh, so here's some things uh, that I would recommend. First, you want to put the patient in a supine or a lateral recumbent position. You don't want them sitting up. The reason is because you got a diaphragm there, and a diaphragm is going to compress the spleen down. It's going to make it a lot more difficult to, to find. Uh, so have the patient laying down. Uh, you want to use your curved array transducer, and you want to place that roughly over the 10th uh, to 11th uh, intercostal space. Also, you want to have them exhaled. When you're uh, when you're visualizing the spleen, why exhale? Because the lung parenchyma will cover the spleen up if they're inhaled. So have them exhaled, uh, and then you want to examine it sort of from the top down, and that's going to help you get a good because uh, when you're looking at the spleen, you want to know if it's enlarged or not. You want to know uh, sort of that height. Uh, of the spleen, how, how big it is from top to bottom. And if it's any more than 12 centimeters, that's considered, that's generally considered, unless you have a really tall patient, in which case you may need to, to bump up uh, your numbers a little bit. Uh, but if it's more than 12 centimeters from, from the superior to inferior pole, 
it's going to be considered enlarged. And so that's why you want to get it from that sort of superior view. Uh, the spleen itself is trapezoidal in shape. So you kind of see that trapezoidal shape right here. Uh, it is, uh, its convex face here is going to be adjacent to uh, the chest wall. And then its concave side is uh, typically in contact with the stomach and the left kidney and the colonic uh, flexure. Within the concavity, you can't see it here because it's just not the right angle, not the right cut here, but uh, within the concavity is that hilum, uh, and that splenic hilum can typically be visualized. You can also see the tail of the pancreas moving in there. So what we do see here is the spleen. Uh, as far as echogenicity, the spleen is going to be roughly the same echogenicity as normal liver tissue. It'll be uh, a little bit more echogenic than the, uh, than the kidney, and you see the kidney right here. Uh, now, when we're talking kidney, I'm talking about kidney tissue. Okay, so here you have your renal pelvis. The renal pelvis is going to be much more echogenic. Uh, but you can see uh, here is our kidney tissue, the medulla of the kidney. Uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be much more uh, hypoechoic than your spleen. But the spleen is going to be very close as far as echogenicity to the liver. It's just slightly uh, less echogenic. Than, or slightly, sorry, slightly more echogenic than the liver. Okay, so here is our spleen here. This looks a little different. It's just because of the settings on the sonography. Uh, so here's our spleen here. Kidney's kind of hard to see. That's uh, kind of a bad picture. Okay, so here's a good one. So here's your spleen here, and then here's your kidney. So a little bit not quite as good optics as good optics as the first one, but uh, this is definitely your your renal pelvis here, medulla of the kidney. This slight little band here, this little band here is uh, where the splenorenal ligament is. And if it, what you should see is just this this thin echogenic band. Uh, and the reason this is important to visualize when you're doing a a, a fast exam. Uh, and you're looking at your spleen, you're not only looking to see if the spleen is evolved or fractured, uh, but you're also looking to see if there's any fluid. Uh, if there's fluid from the kidneys or blood from the spleen, uh, it will collect in this space here. And that's another reason why it's good to have a patient laying down. Typically in the trauma setting, they're going to be laying on a stretcher, uh, but it's good to have a patient laying down because you want that fluid to collect in this area. Okay, this is splenomegaly. Now, I really, it's, it's so hard to kind of describe this because we don't have, uh, this, is looking, uh, this is looking so close and we don't really have our little lines here to show how long it is. But suffice it to say, this is more than 12 centimeters. It'd be nice if we had, I think I have a picture of it next to a kidney. Yeah, okay, here we go. So you can see, here's our kidney going from here to here. Okay, this is the kidney. And you can see the spleen is way bigger than that. You also see that the, the normal contours of the spleen uh, are, are, are sort of obliterated. You don't have that nice trapezoidal shape. It sort of assumes more of a circular or ovoid shape. All right, now looking at CT. It's much easier to tell on CT. But this is the spleen right here on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is the patient's left, this is the spleen, you can see that it's right up wedged against the ribs. And that's the normal position of the spleen. Okay, the spleen is, is it's a pretty flat organ, it's just kind of pushed up against the ribs. Uh, we don't really see the stomach here, but uh, we do see the uh, kidney right here. Okay, so this is a patient, I believe, uh, this is obviously this is spun a make so we'll look at the spleen here. You should never have an organ with this kind of uh, with this kind of resonance uh, on the left side of the body. So you can see again here how it is is roughly the same as the liver, uh, but uh, this spleen is massively enlarged. Uh, this liver here, I believe, this patient has cirrhosis. That's why this liver is a little bit big, and you can see some abnormalities of the texture of the liver here. Uh, but this spleen is, is enlarged, and it's probably due to cirrhosis. So here again, you see another enlarged spleen. Uh, so it's pretty obvious, if you look at normal, 
You know, the spleen is just this little tiny thing, not a whole lot bigger than the kidneys. And then you look here. So here the spleen is kind of pushed up in the other direction, and it's actually making contact with the uh, left lobe of the liver. Uh, now, when you have a normal spleen, it, it will be close, but not touching the liver. So here you see that, well, this is a different cut, but if you were to go down further, the, the liver would make it about this far in the left to right direction. It'll be close, the spleen will be close to the left lobe of the liver, but it will not be touching. If you have splenomegaly, it can get to the point where it's actually touching the liver. So here's our left lobe, here's the spleen, obviously very enlarged. And then this is a coronal view, so this is kind of a nice way to visualize the spleen here. Here it's so big, it's pushing the intestine all up against the, uh, wonder if you could get, uh, I wonder if you could get bowel obstruction from splenomegaly, I don't know. Uh, but yes, this spleen is huge, so uh, this, should not leave any doubt in your mind. All right, I believe that is all I've got for you.